Mike, okay, Mike. it's one after. I think I'll go ahead and start. Uh, my name is Barry Duggan. I'm a graduate of Georgia Tech in electrical engineering back in 1960. And uh, at that time, they weren't teaching digital signal processing because uh, it didn't exist back then. And uh, let's see if I'll do here. Uh, computer programmer since 1962 and ham since 1953 and my current call is KV4FV and I've been involved with new radio for about two years and uh, Derek Kozell are you still there I am indeed yes <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm Derek Kozell. I'm one of the leaders of GNU Radio along with Barry. And I've been licensed since the first year of university. I and currently hold the US call K0ZEL and the uh, British call MW0LNA. I live in Wales now. That's great. How did you end up in Wales for your PhD? <laughs> so my uh, my wife is British, and so I moved from California here to the UK. Uh, and then, oh. as you just said, yeah, I, I started doing a PhD. So I'm working on RF power amplifiers uh, during the day. Great. OK, well, today I'm going to talk about frequency shift keying. And uh, to do that, I'm going to do a screen share so that you can see what, what I'm talking about. And there. Oh, there I am over there. OK. <laughs> Find my way around here. Okay, this was the agenda page and it has all the, the links that you may need later on. So if we go to the simulation example. Gotta watch out for those tabs that are under that other thing I had. Okay. The simulation example is a frequency shift keying transmitter and receiver, and it's strictly bit oriented. We produce bits over here and we receive bits down here. And I'll talk through these blocks, what they do. And I can give you a little bigger picture of that. It's easier to read. So let's go to that one. Same diagram. Uh, oh, we'll be there. Now, we're just going to generate some random bytes. And those are 8 bit bytes, but we are, need to transmit one bit at a time. So we're going to unpack those into eight one bit. Uh, bytes. Now, ready. I'm, all my orientation on this is going to be uh, related to radio teletype, which is called ready. And the uh, baud rate is uh, 22 milliseconds, which is approximately 45 baud. So to produce that baud rate, we do a repeat. The sample rate is 48,000. So if we repeat that sample 1,056 times, we've occupied 22 milliseconds. And then uh, there's no hardware in this whole thing, so we need to do a throttle. 
to keep it running at our sample rate. And then we're going to do everything following in float so we convert that to float. This pair of uh, virtual sync and virtual source are no different than if I had taken this output and connected it to this input of the low pass filter, but it makes a cleaner diagram to do it this way. And also I need the same output down here and that would have been real messy to draw that. The low pass filter uh, knocks off the sharp edges of our transition so we don't produce splatter. And it's a cut off frequency of 200 Hertz. Now let's look at this VCO. What I want is two different tones. The standard ready tones are 2295 for a, a one, a mark, and 2125 for a space. So to make the VCO generate that, I chose a full scale frequency of 2500 Hertz. Could have chosen anything, but that was a nice figure. So to get the, the space frequency of, uh, okay, first the sensitivity is in radian. So it's two pi times the 2500 over an input of one gives me that 15,000. So to get a space, I take the fraction of that 2125 divided by 2500. So I need an input of 0.85. So when I have a zero, I want 0.85 going into the VCO. So to get a mark, I need to get the ratio of 2295 over 2500. So I need to add 0 0.068 to give me a total of 0.918. So here's what I did. I took multiplied that input, which is either one or zero by 0 0.068, added 0 0.85 and run that into the VCO. Um, since I'm full screen, I don't have any feedback. So if, if someone wants to ask a question, I will address that. Right now, I'm not hearing anything, <laughs> which is a little disconcerting. I don't even hear myself in my headphones. It's okay. Okay. So that's the end of the transmit side. Now I'm going to receive it. So I take that FSK output and I downshift it. Going into this, the frequencies were 2295 and 2125 with a center of 2210. So I downshift it so that those tones are centered at 2210 in the baseband. So anything above 2210 is a positive frequency anything below 2210 is a negative frequency. Um, Barry? Yes. Can I ask a question if that's okay? Sure. Um, so hopefully um, from my experience, inexperience here, uh, what's the bandwidth that's generated with R, uh, RTTY? So is the 15,000 the actual bandwidth of the signal or the bandwidth isn't around 2,500? The actual Frequency deviation is only 170 hertz. Okay, okay. And then you're switching between the two frequencies. Right. Okay, got it, got it. So as long as we have softened those switching points, we don't generate a very wide uh, band spectrum. And so, so the 15,000, okay. oh, go ahead if you're, okay. Uh, you're, you're referring to the low pass here? No, choosing the full scale frequency of 2500, the VCO max with an input of plus one, the VCO sensitivity is two times pi times 2500 over one, which is 15708. Right. So uh, that's, why, did I, why did I choose 2500? Yeah. It, it had to be something greater than 2295. Okay. And because and that, that gave me 0.918. 
using the 2500. If I had chosen a larger frequency, it would have given me a smaller uh, input, but also very less variation between the mark and the space. So mm, I figured okay. I'd get the best accuracy out of the VCO by okay. choosing a scale not much larger than what I needed. Is this typical for RIDI from like the commercial systems or is it? Uh, the, the 2295 mark and the 2125 space are standardized uh, pretty much worldwide. Okay. okay. And the only okay. variation, which I'll get back to in a little bit is which, which tone is mark and which tone is space, but I'll, I'll We'll look at that in a minute. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so we have a baseband here with the two frequencies split between a positive frequency and a negative frequency. The squelch we really don't need until we get on the air, but for consistency, uh, consistency, I, I go ahead and put it in here. So, the quadrature demod will produce a positive output if the frequency is above zero and a negative output if the frequency is below zero. Remember, we're in the complex domain here. So that we get a, a plus something or other out for a mark and a minus something or other out for a space. So when we run that into a binary slicer, it produces a one if the input is above zero and a zero if the input is zero or negative. So now we're back to the bits that we generated up here in this first line. And converting that to float, we have the same signal as what we transmitted. And I pulled that down here. Now, if we were to just compare the two, they wouldn't match because there is a delay in the processing of all of these blocks through the filter and the VCO and another filter and so forth. So we have to introduce a delay in the transmit signal if we want to try to match it to the receive signal. And it turns out that delay is 202. So if you run the simulation yourself, you'll see that. Um, I think I will move on. I would have run it if, we'd, if I had been a little quicker in that first part, but uh, I think I'll proceed with the next next phase. And we'll, we'll be going through these blocks again a little more hurriedly here in a minute. So uh, okay, to review, this is just bits in, bits out. There's no word orientation and we did not reassemble this byte up here from the random source. So this is just a bit strain. Now, when we look at a, a real world uh, use of this, where we apply it to Bodo, I think is the correct, correct pronunciation of Emil's name. He's the one who created that. Uh, I'm going to take a message in and I'm going to convert it from UTF-8 to Bodo, which is a five-bit character, a start, so that the whole thing is one start bit, five data bits, and one or more stop bits. And if, when I say one or more stop bits, it can be one one and a half, which is only used in some old machines, and two, which is the most common, 
or it can be semi-infinite because it, it is totally asynchronous character at a time. And I run that into, we're still at 48,000 sample rate. So I have the same repeat here of to get the 22 millisecond and change that to float. I'll go ahead and do this and then come back to this conversion here. So it's the same filter to smooth the edges, the same VCO setup to get the two tones and then output to an audio sync. And then I also have a scope trace here that'll look at the tones and the, the data. Now going back to this, this is actually a Python, embedded Python program. And let me, right here. Uh, this is actually in available in the links to my package. So I have a table of all of the, let's see, can I move that over a little bit here, uh, of all of the Bodo character set. And so I, I take the text in, uh, look it up in the table, generate the correct Bodo code and then serialize it and print it out as a vector. So that's what's happening there. Okay, now on the uh, receive side, I'm doing the, the same, let's see. I guess you folks are seeing me here uh, superimposed on this diagram, aren't you? So let me see if I can move that over a little bit. No, it's okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's the same chain for the receive. We've got the fur filter that's doing the same, uh, translating the tones down centered on 2210. And I'll come back to that decimation in just a second. Here's my squelch, here's the D mod. So now let me talk about the decimation. We came in at 48,000 sample rate and I'm gonna decimate that by 50. That means divide it by 50, which gives me a sample rate coming out of here of 960. And then run that through the quadrature D mod into another resampler. Which, uh, the resampler does both interpolation and decimation. So you can adjust your sample rate to whatever you want. Well, if we decimate by 960 and interpolate by 500, we get a sample rate of 500 which is exactly 11 samples per bit, which is why I chose the 500. If I had used some other sample rate, I would have had a non or not an exact determinant of how many, you know, where the bit boundaries were is what I'm trying to say. But by going to 500 samples per second, I have 11 samples in 22 milliseconds. And that's what I was achieving at this point. So then I'm going to tell you what, I'll pull, pull this down. Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna, so coming out of here, I've got 11 samples per uh, symbol time is the correct terminology for the Bodo. And here's what I was saying. Sometimes the mark and space frequencies are inverted. If you're on uh, 40 meters or below in the US, I guess worldwide, you use lower sideband and that inverts the frequencies. So all of a sudden mark is the, is the uh, 21, 23. 
5 and the space is the 2295. So I needed a switch to be able to, to go back and forth between the two. And so I did a GUI chooser with a multiply of one or minus one to do that inversion. And then uh, coming across here, we've got, got the same uh, binary slicer. And the terminal display sync is another embedded Python block. And it's right up here. So it reads the stream of ones and zeros. There are 11 samples for every bit time. So this is basically a software UART. I'm synchronizing on the start bit. I'm doing majority voting on whether that bit is a one or a zero. I think I'm using seven out of the 11 bits to decide whether it's a one or a zero. And then I, I gather the five data bits and I convert it to UTF-8. And as soon as I've gotten a good stop bit, I go back to looking for a start bit. So that's why it will take the one stop bit, the one and a half stop bits, two stop bits, three, four, infinity stop bits, because it's searching for another start. OK, let me go back here. And then I spit that out to a CMQ message sync. So now let me look at the overall plan here. Uh, Barry, is it possible yes. I can ask another question? Yes. Um, back to your Python code, is, is that sort of like a like a walking window technique for your start and stop bits? It is, uh, yeah, you, there is a, if you go to my, let's see, where are we here? Yeah, if you, that, if you go go to my my page where you, you got the uh, yeah. oh it's it's okay it, anyway on 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 the page where you got the link to to join this meeting yeah there is a link to gr ready basics it's a github in in that package is that code for the the sending and receiving the code conversion yeah i have so, it in front of me here okay 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 so, thanks so these files fe block zero zero and fe block zero are in the transmit and receive portions of that uh, github okay yeah okay thanks okay now Next thing I want to do is uh, do a loop back to show you that this really works. So we're we're going to uh, here's the the transmit coming to an audio output jack. Going to patch that into the receive that has an audio input jack, and then we're going to send the the text to this GR web server, which is a terminal emulation program I wrote. It is web-based and it's written in Node.js and you'll see it here in just a minute. So anyway, received text gets displayed, sent text gets displayed as well and sent to really transmit. So let's go ahead and, uh, and set that up. I've got a cheat sheet here in front of me. <laughs> so this that's going to be three processes there. The transmit, receive, and the web server. So I'm going to open a window. And I have shortcuts here. Save me a lot of typing and avoiding mistyping. So 
So here's my transmit uh, scope screen. Like that. And then I'll open another window and I'll do the web server. And this, this, like I say, it's uh, browser based. This is just another tab in Firefox in my case here. So whatever I type in this input box, one line at a time, uh, as soon as you hit return, it gets sent to the transmit side and you'll see this in action in a minute. So we need to start the receiver. And there's my receive window. And my noise is way down here below 100 and minus 120 dB because it's just a straight cable. Now here's my reverse switch, uh, normal or reverse push buttons. So let me get some text to, and the tradition is uh, Quick bound Fox, which if you're not familiar with it, is contains every letter in the alphabet. And by the time we finish with the figures, we'll have every figure in the photo character set. So I will copy that, go back here and paste it to my input. Now, I'll show you three things here. First of all, when I hit return or enter, whatever you like to call it, it will be displayed here with a greater than sign in front of it, which means it's outgoing. And then when I get an answer back, it will be displayed under that with a less than meaning it's incoming. So let me hit this and there's that. And then my there's my transmit and that's the tones in red and the data in blue. And then the receive, uh, I didn't catch it in time. We'll get that next go around. On the receive side. Oops. My microphone. I was having a little microphone problems this morning with it switching between the the uh, camera mic so you can hear and the the audio jack for. That's probably what I need to do. Sorry for the delay here. I don't see a, don't see a microphone here.
Mm -hmm. Well, I may just move on to the on the air <laughs> demo because it uses different input. So let's do that. Uh, anyway, on the web server here, any received data would come in here and display. Let me just check real quick here. It's outgoing. No joy on the input. So let me let me just move move on here. Stop that. And close that. And close that. And close that. Close these terminals as well, because sometimes they have stuff hanging around we don't want to hang around. Okay, so the next phase of this demo is to do an on the air demo. So we're going to use a different transmit that feeds into a USRP, a uh, B200 mini over the air radio signal into a Pluto receiver in the Raspberry Pi with the same receive program. This is actually an audio link across here and back into the web server. So somebody talk to me and tell me that we're still, still good. All good. Okay. All good. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> like, still alive. like I say, like, like I say, there I hear nothing unless one of you speaks. So uh, we're we're in uh, we're in absolute awe. <laughs> no, it's going well. <laughs> okay, as in all live demos, even though you pre-test it, it doesn't always do what you want it to do when you go. So basically, live. you're just transmitting across the room type of scenario, right? Uh, actually, it's about six inches away from the. <laughs> The transmitter and receiver. Okay. But, uh, so the path uh, loss isn't that great. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, I'm also in the uh, milliwatt power range here. So, uh, but anyway, let me see if my screen will work over here for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it would be so, interesting offline yeah, if yeah. do you have a transmitter onto a HF antenna. Are you in the States? You could try to transmit and I could try to see if I can get you in. in I don't Canada. think you'd receive me on uh, two or three milliwatts. Well, I was just saying if you had a hundred watt transmitter or something. Yeah, anyway, right. <laughs> that, yeah. that's next week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <Okay>. That's <laughs> offline. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can move myself down here way down here in the corner. Yeah, that'll help. Okay, what you're seeing is the screen on the Raspberry Pi. And the magic to do this is through uh, VNC. But sometimes you'll see this pause a little bit. And the reason for that is the VNC client on the Ubuntu would not talk to the Raspberry Pi but it would talk to my Mac and my Mac would talk to the Raspberry Pi. So we're actually relaying this picture from the Ubuntu to the Mac to the Raspberry Pi. Fun in games. So what I'm gonna do now is I've already got the, the radio part of the receiver running over here. I'm going to start the uh, the uh, ready receive program. And just to be safe, I'm gonna do it on the keyboard of the Raspberry Pi instead of, okay, 19 and 20.
takes a minute to come up. Okay, and there's my receive. So let me move those over where you can see them better. That's the, that's the receive. There's my squelch that I'm really using this time since it's on the air, my normal reverse uh, switch. And my, I have more noise now because this is really receiving signal. So I'm up to minus 80 over here. And then uh, on the receiver here, there's my spectrum. And I'm using 144.95 as the, the frequency. So there's the receive side. So let me now go back to the, the uh, Lenovo, which is running the Ubuntu 20.04. And uh, what do I want to do here? Yeah. Okay, I want to start two processes. Back to my cheat sheet. Okay, let's see. I think we have, yeah, we have time. Uh, first thing you do when you're receiving ready is to get it tuned in. So I actually wrote a program to transmit the letters character, and then I will tune the receiver to get that where it needs to be. So let me, let me do that. Uh, and I will add that to the GR ready basics package next week. It's not there yet, but the, the transmit is. Okay, letters. So I am now transmitting the, the letters character, which is just a start bit and the rest are ones, so five ones plus the stop, which is another one, and two stops, which is two more ones, yeah. Okay, and uh, give it a little, yeah. give it a little more gain there. Okay, now let me go back to the this screen share. Or I mean the Raspberry Pi screen. And you see this white line up here in the middle of the spectrum. That is my there it is. That is my signal being transmitted. And you see down here in the receive, that's my spike for the the uh, mark frequency. And I'd like to get that up a little higher. So I'm going to do some tuning. And I'm going to bring that. Let's see. I want to get it closer. That's, that's pretty good. Okay, so I adjusted the BFO. get that where you can see it better. I adjusted the BFO to, to where I got my signal on the, the receiver down about 2300. Okay. So that's how I've, I've got it tuned in. So let me go back to the demo here. Okay, on the transmit, I want to stop transmitting. And instead, yeah, <laughs> make sure I'm, I'm where I think I am. 
I want to do an actual. So there's my transmitter window on the Ubuntu. And then I need to start the GR web server again. But this time, instead of listening to the local uh, receiver, I'm going to listen to the uh, Raspberry Pi, which has a different IP address. So that's uh, That's that one. So now let me see if if uh, luck is with us here. Sometimes when you're tuning, you'll pick up there. Hey, great. Sometimes when you're tuning, you'll pick up garbage, which you don't see until you get a carriage return. So. Uh, I'm sending out some traditional already uh, separator signals, like sort of the beginning of message kind of thing. So we're going good here, and I'll show you all the action as we go along. Yeah, we're okay on time. Okay, we're back to uh, Quick Brown Fox. So let me copy that again and paste that in here. Okay, and I'll try to show you three things that is happening concurrently. Okay, when I, let's see, and here's the outgoing signal. You can see it's actually running that step. And then here's the receive. You see the white band is, is the, uh, the signal going out. And down here was the receive showing the mark and space frequencies. And then if we go here, sometimes we'll pick up a little garbage character, but uh, there's the quick brown fox. So now let me do figures. Uh, there's Bodo, uh, since it's only five bits, you can do the alphabet and a little bit more, but to get figures, they decided to use a letters, figures, two shift characters, shift to letters, shift to figures, figures being all this special stuff. So anytime the uh, code re encounters, well, it starts in letters. So right here at the apostrophe after dog, it had to do a, a figure shift and the apostrophe and then a letter shift and then the S. So here I'm going to do a whole the re remaining uh, figures. Here's the transmit, and here's the receive. You can see the peaks there, and there's the return text. And since I'm on the air, I better send a station ID. So let me do that. Don't want the FCC after me. I, I don't think they'll be after you at this power level. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, I have actually transmitted from my office here to the kitchen, which is on the other end of the house, about uh, you know, 60 feet or something like that. And uh, that's as far as I've tried to test it. But that was with a, an old laptop, laptop which has since uh, crashed. So I couldn't do that test today. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about having someone in the kitchen 
on a full working setup. So instead of getting echoes back, I'd get uh, whatever they typed, which would be even more fascinating. So that is the, are there any questions before I turn off screen, shape, screen sharing? <laughs> Uh, I do have one quick one, if that's okay, um, sure. Mike here again. Um, that's very, very interesting that you, you did the GR web server. That, I, that's very cool. So theoretically, as it currently stands, if I had an internet connection to your house, I could go in, write the software, and then I can get your output texted to my web browser from your receiver. Theoretically, if I were to connect to your to your through your house route router and stuff is, is uh, that you understand what i'm asking yes that is that is correct this link right here from the yes. web server to the transmitter is uh ip link but it's local uh on this side but it doesn't have to be local and what i'm doing here on this side is using the uh IP addresses of the Raspberry Pi and the Ubuntu. And so, 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 you know, once it's in that form, it, these, uh, these sockets can be anywhere in the world if you had the IP uh, linkage for it. Yeah, um, going through the router. Yeah. So that's, that's very interesting. So someone like me or whoever in the world can transmit uh, on on your computer and hear my and hear it theoretically if you're going out on the air 100 watts and then um, receive it and vice versa right yeah. yeah that's that's quite interesting that's cool yeah or I could I could send you the the text uh, on this link yeah and you could receive it that's right on this link <laughs> yeah and see what i'm sending exactly yeah no that's so a cool. lot, lot of possibilities there yeah no it's very good it's very good and of course if you have a traditional uh, sideband rig you just plug the audio into your sideband rig yeah. instead of loop back exactly it's yeah. ready to go no, that's um, really cool it's re well done very well done uh, thank you Okay. Uh, oh, we got a latecomer here. Uh, greetings to the one that just came in. Uh, we are recording this, so uh, what you missed, which is most of it, uh, will be put up on uh, YouTube as soon as uh, Derek can take care of that. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing so that I can see people again here. Ah, uh, it's scary. <laughs> Let me do a gallery view so I'm not staring my face, staring at myself in such full screen glory. <laughs> okay, uh, at this point, um, if there are no more technical questions on, on the presentation, I'd like to discuss uh, you know, do you like this whole deal of having these video meetings with presentations? Uh, how often should we do it? Uh, and as, as many as you want, uh, either do it on your camera or over here on chat and let's, let's see what uh, you have to say. Uh, so my, my first question was, uh, do you like doing it once a month or, or whatever? Yeah, I think the interval we had between this and the last meeting was pretty good. Well, that was three weeks, but that's because this was a repeat. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And of course, we're staring at the holidays, which is my next question. Should we skip the holidays and just go to January for the next one? Uh, you think that's probably best? I don't know, I see no reason to skip. Nobody's going on holidays anyway. Just talk at yeah. home. That's, that's, yeah, that's we, can, we, can give, we got Thanksgiving and then uh, the Christmas or whatever other celebration people make around that time. 
We, we maybe, might actually have more time to play. <laughs> <laughs> Hadn't thought of that. Uh, if my plans work out, I'll be at the beach over the Christmas and New Year's, but uh, I'll have my computer with me. I guess there's no, no reason I couldn't do something from there. And then uh, I don't think Michelle Thompson made it this morning. She was going to try to, but she had volunteered to do one on the uh, FCC rulings on, on amateur satellite communications and then talk more about amateur satellite in general. And uh, I haven't sure. gotten feedback from her and uh, a couple of others have indicated some possible uh, programs like free DV and uh, I think there were some others. Anyway, I need volunteers. Uh, I don't uh, anticipate hosting or providing demos uh, on a continuing basis. I'll certainly uh, be a participant. Yeah, Adrian, go ahead. Uh, sorry, yeah. So I, I think I have uh, something to present as well. Um, I can present it today really short uh, if uh, there's uh, enough time uh, remaining in the meeting. I don't know if the screen sharing will work because uh, for me, the whole meeting has been black screen. I'm using the browser and not the Zoom application. So I hope it would work. And uh, if you have time now, if not next week, it's uh, or next time, it's fine for me. Uh, according to schedule, we only have seven minutes. So I, I think we ought to. Uh... The Zoom call will stay open or can stay open. So okay. if we don't mind running a little long. What, what do you have, Adrian? Uh, yeah, so uh, there's uh, just some recent things I've been working on uh, this week. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, video uh, video transmission with the GNU radio. Uh, it's something that I had been working uh, for some time, at least two years, but uh, now the video also has sound, so uh, it's uh, more user friendly. Uh, you can actually hear the person uh, talking. Cool. I, did you have any other questions, Barry? Um, oh, is it that you? Yeah. <laughs> Adrian, uh, what are you yeah, Just the basic, uh, uh, you know, trying to plan another meeting and uh, how we go about it. Mm -hmm. So is this uh, Adrian's screen we're seeing here? It is, yes. Yeah, so uh, just uh, let me switch uh, the audio. You will not be hearing me for a couple moments uh, because I will switch audio to uh, the receiver, and then you'll hopefully hear me over the over the radio. So the transceiver is in loopback mode. It's working duplex, uh, so it's duplex operation and it's loopback. Uh, it's uh, the antennas are like ten centimeters uh, uh, away from one another, so uh, it's just very low power. I'll just switch the audio to if it will allow me. I hope it allows me to switch the audio, but Adrian, uh, I think you need to change it in Zoom itself. I had the same issue just before. You need to change in Zoom. You cannot change it via the uh, view, the view control. Uh, what is it called? Yeah. So I if you go to uh, in Zoom, your audio setting, audio, and there you can change your. Uh, no, on top of the microphone. I think you need to change your microphone. And uh, you need yeah. to change your correct. It's, uh, it's just that. I don't hear anything. I know. Supposed to no, hear I don't either. <laughs> yeah, there's indeed a do back.
I should probably uh, put out an ID then. This is MW0LNA. Hey, Dina, I don't know if you are transmitting, but we do not hear you. Hear you. Hear you. There's a very nice uh, echo. So hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So uh, because uh, apparently Zoom in the browser has some issues with pulse audio, I will just uh, disregard the sound and just show you how this works. So I've implemented the um, uh, video transmission in the radio uh, with sound as well now. So it's uh, no longer just uh, you know uh, like. Uh, uh, silent movies of the 80s thing. Uh, the video is, uh, is quite low resolution uh, because uh, I try to keep the bandwidth uh, uh, usage low. Uh, so this is the video signal being uh, being transmitted here. Um, there is a there is also a um, constellation display where you can monitor the, the signal quality. So if I if I increase the the gain, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the signal becomes suddenly a lot more uh, readable here. Um, so, uh, uh, right now, uh, the way the video works is uh, it captures uh, the video from the camera, uh, then creates, uh, creates um, uh, some frames, uh, they are encoded in a JPEG uh, format, uh, also adds uh, the audio frames, uh, which have the sound, okay, so this is the radio timeout, <laughs> it's uh, warning. warning me because uh, I have a timeout set at uh, two minutes uh, for the transmission. Uh, so uh, the, the video frames will be transmitted together with the audio frames. Uh, the flow graph uh, is uh, just a very basic uh, differential QPSK modulation. It's single carrier, so it's not um, OFPM, it's uh, just single carrier uh, uh, differential QPSK modulation. And it's got um, convolutional uh, encoding and decoding uh, forward error correction in the signal. As you can see, the signal is about um, about uh, 350, uh, 325 uh, kilohertz uh, wide. Uh, so this is something I'm working on for the um, Quebec Oscar 100 uh, amateur radio satellite, which we can uh, we can use here in Europe. Um, and I hope that with my limited uh, antenna and, uh, and uh, the limited output power from the transceiver, will I, I'll manage to, to do some uh, video. Um, QSOs with, uh, with other hams uh, you can access the satellite. Yeah, so uh, sorry for the quality. The quality is basically, um, it's, um, yeah, so uh, there's some light uh, going right into my camera because uh, this is, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not really good, uh, good uh, quality video, but uh, it's, I think it's just about enough to say that you're actually uh, transmitting uh, video over the air. So th this is a code that I recently committed uh, just this week. Uh, so it's, um, uh, I've switched the video back, uh, backend from um, uh, video for Linux 2 uh, to use uh, the, QT, uh, the QT video backend, uh, which you, uh, under the hood uses the uh, GStreamer uh, plugins. Uh, so there are some issues. The GStreamers plugin is bad uh, library is needed, and um, there are still some issues. Uh, probably that's why it's called uh, GStreamer plugin is bad. Uh, there are still some issues left. So uh, I'll be working. Uh, you know, hopefully until Christmas, I'll be able to get something uh, quite stable that doesn't randomly crash or something like that. Uh, but yeah, so this is what I want to show. Like I said, I wanted to make it really, really short and uh, just show you how this works. So video, transmitting uh, video and um, also audio. Uh, you will notice that if I, uh, if I uh, stop transmitting, the, the window will be gone, so it will no longer uh, show. And if I start transmitting, uh, yeah, by the way, this is something I wanted to, to ask. Sometimes, apparently on uh, very high symbol rates, uh, the Costas loop uh, seems to lock onto the wrong phase angle, so I tried uh, asking for advice on the uh, on the general channel, but I don't know why why uh, is this happening. 
uh, it should be slicing at 45 degrees, but uh, sometimes it doesn't work. If I, if I restart the, uh, the program, some, it uh, usually uh, comes back uh, normal. Um, so I think um, this, is, this is it. I don't want to thank you anymore of your time. Uh, the latest uh, news from you, let's see. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Adrian. Uh, and actually, just can you talk briefly about um, Q Radio Link and and what it is as an application? Because I I suspect that some people here won't won't have seen it before and won't realize that it's using GNU Radio uh, entirely on the core. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Adrian. I'm uh, from Romania. My call sign is Yanki Oscar Eight Romeo Zulu Zulu. Uh, I've been using GNU Radio since uh, 2006, uh, just as a user, so I didn't actually write a lot of code uh, with uh, GNU Radio, but I've been using it for experiments uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this period of time. So um, while I was doing that, I, um, I saw the very nice software uh, by Alex uh, Chete, um, Oscar Zulu 9 Alpha Echo Charlie, uh, which is GQRX. Uh, and it was using the GNU Radio API under the hood. Uh, so around, uh, I think, 2016, I started to I started to try to work on a, on a full transceiver because GQRX is uh, receiver only. So uh, inspired by um, by uh, the features in GQRX, I, I tried to build something uh, quite similar. Um, it's uh, based on Qt, so the the whole uh, the whole uh, interface is uh, basically Qt. Uh, it's uh, Linux only, so you, unfortunately you won't be able to use it on other operating systems because uh, uh, I'm I'm a Linux only user since uh, a long time, and I honestly don't know how to program under Windows or other uh, Mac or uh, uh, FreeBSD. I've never used them, so uh, uh, it's a Linux only right now. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's using a GNU Radio under the hood for all the digital software processing. So uh, there are GNU uh, Radio flow graphs. Uh, there written in, uh, in C++, uh, just to, as an example. So this is like uh, the way that uh, the flow graphs uh, look like. Uh, they're written in C++. Uh, that's not because I don't like Python. I'm actually a Python developer myself, but uh, I, um, I kind of hate uh, Sweet and uh, I find it a lot easier to just call the C++ API directly and link against it. And this is what uh, Curator Link is uh, is doing. Um, it's got a bunch of C++ code uh, organized into um, uh, flow graphs. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, digital modes which I use for e experimenting myself, like uh, uh, frequency shifting to FSK and uh, respectively uh, for FSK. Uh, also, uh, BPSK, binary PSK, and um, free DV, but uh, I'll let the mate uh, talk about free DV because it's uh, really his baby. Um, also, um, uh, there are some other uh, modulators and modulators like uh, narrowband FM. Um, this is what I've been uh, actually using the most in the last year or so because um, uh, we have a lot of FM repeaters here and um, I access them remotely uh, using uh, using uh, curated link. Um, curated link can can also connect uh, to a uh, voice over IP server, uh, which uses uh, Mumble, and can uh, forward uh, the audio uh, to the Mumble server. And then from the Mumble, uh, so the, the architecture of the Mumble server, uh, you murmur the way it's called, it's a, it's a hub and spoke architecture. Uh, it allows uh, any number of clients uh, to, to connect to it, and uh, it's obviously full duplex. Uh, so if you have like uh, let's say a bunch of uh, SDR uh, uh, based um, nodes, um, you can uh, so whatever is received on, on one SDR, it will be forwarded to all the other nodes, uh, which will appear as users uh, here in the channel. So uh, let me just um, I'll open the the actual um, map, mumble. Uh, so uh, this is this is what uh, the Mumble client. Uh, Mumble is a very very well known software used for uh, voice chat. Um, it's very actually very good, and the protocol is extremely uh, well documented. So this is why I've used it. Uh, so yeah, so this is what I was talking about. 
uh, you see a lot of issues with the, the G streamer plugins. Um, Okay. Um, Adrian? Yeah. I have a question if that's okay. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Can you um, hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm just curious, which uh, SDR are you using? Uh, so here I have uh, I have quite a number of SDRs. So I started by using a couple of USRPs. I had a B200 and a B205 mini. Um, but that was uh, when I was located in Ireland. So here in Romania, unfortunately, you cannot just buy them using the credit card. I think they're restricted for export or something. So when I came back to Romania, I just uh, I got a couple of other devices. Uh, currently, I'm using uh, to transmit. I'm using a, um, a LimeNet Micro. It's a, it's a device which is quite similar to Lime SDR Mini, but it's it's also got uh, an embedded Raspberry Pi module. I'm also I'm also a user of the Lime uh, Lime SDR Mini. I have a couple of them here lying around, um, and uh, mainly uh, lately I think uh, my main driver has been the Puto SDR. So I have a couple of Puto SDRs here. Uh, I use them because they're cheap and um, I can uh, I can uh, you know uh, give them to fellow uh, fellow radio hands. Uh, uh, local guys here and uh, let them uh, let them test them. So that's my main driver. But I, I also have a couple of other uh, devices, uh, Lime SDRs basically. The USRPs I uh, I gave them to uh, um, to um, um, what, what's it called it's, um, it's one of those hacker clubs where they experiment with stuff. I wasn't using them at full. Uh, they're very capable and I wasn't really using them fully. Uh, so I uh, I gave them away. I only have the Lime SDRs now and the and the Pluto SDRs. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Adrian, a question: Is that the uh, the television mode that's now used on Q100, which is narrow band? Uh, I think what it's called NB TV or something. No, no, no. Oh, no, no re reduced. No, reduced. Uh, reduced band it's, TV. Uh, it's no. It's um. So uh, that's something that I, I didn't really have time to look into. So I'm like in the last year, I've written very little code. I'm quite busy with work and uh, this whole pandemic situation. So uh, I've had to limit my, uh, my, my involvement with the code. Uh, I haven't looked at that. Uh, this is something that I came up with uh, maybe two years ago. It's uh, something that I use for experimentation and with a, a couple of uh, other hams here on the um, f higher frequencies, uh, yeah. 1.2 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Um, okay. Yeah, because not so just because you mentioned to Q100, I know they use something called the. Yes, uh, I, I I plan to actually I plan to actually look into other uh, video modes. I just don't know um, what's the status of the supporting GNU radio because I am reluctant to uh, use other DSP libraries other than GNU radio because I simply am very familiar with the uh, GNU radio. So. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, why uh, I tend to use anything that's uh, uh, no radio okay. based. Uh, maybe maybe also in the future uh, there are some very nice modules from uh, Run uh, W6 uh, RZ uh, for DVDs transmission. I plan to look into that when I have time. Uh, also, um, something else that I wanted to mention. So uh, uh, there's uh, you're not gonna do much unless you can use. Um, higher power. Uh, so you're not going to get very far with these small SDR devices. So what I've done, I've implemented support for um, some USB relays. Uh, they're um, based on the chip FT232 uh, from FTDI. Uh, so if I click here on enable uh, relays and then uh, uh, I've basically just enabled relays and then uh, there's there's another setting here and I can select which relays to toggle. So my setup here is uh, basically uh, the SDR the relays. I have some uh, some uh, transmit receive switches which are controlled by the relays, and um, some amplifiers and filters, of course, for uh, for every uh, particular band. Uh, there is an interesting device which is um, maybe expected to come up. It's called the Lime RFE. 
it should do pretty much the same thing, uh, except that, uh, you know, I have uh, some higher power amplifiers here. My playground is generally two meters and above uh, into microwave. And um, I use up to maybe 50 watts on, uh, on these frequencies. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask a question or a comment, Adrian, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Um, have you heard of the BATC, the ports down transmitter? Uh, yes, yes, I've um, I've heard of it. Um, I haven't had a lot of time to play with it uh, because um, uh, I haven't figured out how to control uh, the transmit to receive sequence. So, um, you know, my time is <laughs> is really quite limited. I think. Uh, most of the time, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, chatting up with uh, people here on repeaters and stuff like that. And uh, maybe once every two months, I get some weekends to experiment with uh, new stuff. But um, the ports down transmitter, I am planning to to try that on the Q uh, Quebec Oscar 100 satellite as soon yeah. as I can uh, as soon as I can get. Uh, you guys are lucky. <laughs> so, uh, Adrian, good news. I've tested the GNU Radio DVB blocks against a ports down transmitter. Um, and so if you can find all the right settings, they are compatible. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's cool. Yeah. And now we just need a fast internet from Canada up to somewhere in Europe so you can go upstream. <laughs> Cardiff University volunteers. <laughs> well, we, we have pretty good fiber network in Canada, so. <laughs> oh, Barry's back. Hi, Barry. Okay, I have uh, moved some cables around, and the demo I did three weeks ago, I actually had to move cables during the demo and thought I had fixed it where I didn't need to today. But what I'm going to try to do here, let's see what I have running. I still have the, yeah, let me, if y'all want to hang with me, um, I'm going to go back and close down the, get back to my starting point here. I'm going back to this audio loopback, except I'm actually using the receive in the, the uh, Raspberry Pi. So my patch cable goes from the output jack of, of the Lenovo down to the input jack of the Raspberry Pi now. And uh, everything. If the stars line up, I should get the, <laughs> get it to work this time. Oh, one other thing that just came to mind, there's actually, if you're interested in radio teletype, there's actually a news service that runs around the clock on the internet where you can go to it and plug that audio into your receiver and so basically you're, you're running that uh, path from the, uh, your audio output of your computer into the ready receive program and then into the web server. But, and I'll give that link here in a minute. So let me, uh, what am I doing here? Got to figure out what I'm doing here. Oh. Um, Okay, for loop back, I need. Oh, let me go back to screen sharing. That would help. Yeah, okay. Now I'm, I'm going to go back to. Uh, my transmit. I'm sure glad I didn't have to type all these commands. Let's 
So there's my ready VCO, which is the audio transmit side. And an audio patch cable going down to receive running in the Raspberry Pi. So let me start the web server. Okay. And see, I, I can actually go back and make corrections here until I hit the enter key. Oops. We can hear the tones in the background. <laughs> oh, you can hear that? Okay. Oh, I started the wrong one here. Let me fix that. My uh, yeah. I use the local IP addresses and not not the uh, others. Yeah, there's my hello. So along with a little garbage to start. Yeah, can you hear those tones? Yeah, we can hear them. Okay, that, that's what really sounds like. So let's go back to the QBF, which is the shorthand for quick bound box. <laughs> That's funny. And there, there's the transmit. And that's that's the tones and that's the, the data is in blue. And there's the receive side. So this is through the audio or over the air again? This is the audio loop back. Right. It didn't, Got it. didn't work the first time around. Got it. Got it. So maybe Derek can patch this in when he builds the uh, video for the for the YouTube. Yeah, cut and paste is no problem. So you want me to do one more time and show you the uh, the screen on the the Raspberry Pi. I can use the the screen from the Raspberry Pi before. I think that should. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Well, this doesn't use the radio receiver this time. It's only using the uh, the uh, ready receive part. Um, Barry, uh, yeah. do we have time? Uh, are you able to go into your filter a little bit? I'm just curious what your bandpass is and, and more details on the actual filter, if we have time. Okay, uh, sure. You're talking about on transmit or receive or? Uh, receive would be the receive more so that okay. I can understand. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay, the audio coming in, as you heard, is the two tones of 2295 and 2125. And the this frequently translating per filter, <laughs> it's a mouth tongue twister, downshifts that spectrum, centers it on 2210, which is halfway between those two tones. Okay. So what would be the pass bend then? Okay. Well, keep in mind it's only 170 hertz between the two tones. So okay. the, the low pass filter. Uh, am I? Yeah, I'm, I'm screen sharing. There it is. Uh, so it, it's a uh, float to complex with real taps, and uh, 
the filter, which I also list on that uh, a tutorial, a gain of one at the sample rate, uh, audio pass band of a thousand hertz, and a roll off of four hundred. Okay. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Do we have and a question? I, I, Sorry. No, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, is my audio on here? I have a question. Okay. I've, I've never seen the frequency in translating block actually that takes floats to complex because I usually have something that takes complex to complex. Does it well, mean you, have, to... you have choices for whichever you want? Uh, yeah, but yeah, so you've got the whole range here. That means it needs to first do some conversion going from floats to complex, which probably means that you throw away one three quarter of your bandwidth. Is that the trick that they do? I don't know somebody uh, with more uh, DSP <laughs> knowledge. Well, you're throwing away negative frequencies, but incoming, all you've got is audio, which is... Uh, well, I understand. So you start, with some, you start something that has fair frequency 0 to 24 kilohertz on zero, only the positive side. And then he converts it, for, I think, first to complex, and then does the down, downshifting. Or am I wrong here? Uh, you're asking which happens first. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know who okay, actually but, wrote this block, but the first let, time let I me, see actually, I, the first time I see this block X taking uh, floats as input and not uh, complex. Okay, let me show you what I do. I'm still in screen share here. Okay, uh, I I do understand. I go, that's, I'd go to category block docs. I hope hmm. you were familiar with those. And then I'd go to frequency translating fur filter, which is right here. And it has a really nice explanation of translating yeah, from but, the input to the output. But that block starts with a complex. If you look at the graph, it starts with something that's complex because you see it's not uh, symmetric. You're talking about this, my this, this, this is good. No, 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 no. The, the drawing you see on that page. Oh, the, yeah. The, right. Starts with something that's complex because it's not uh, symmetric okay. on zero. So it's complex already. Right. But the audio would just be uh, the positive frequencies. Okay. And, and and so just like the orange is here, we're going to shift that mm -hmm. down so that the two ready frequencies are plus and minus with the center frequency of 2210 in the middle there. Yeah, it sounds fun. And so that's what we want. Oh, I see. So this exciting FIR filter is combining all these into one block. That's is right. That what I'm it's, understanding? it's doing it's doing okay. three things for us. Okay. It's, it's translating the frequencies. It's filtering so that we just get what we want here with the uh, anti-aliasing. Okay. And then it's decimating for me because I wanted that too because I'm decimating by 50 in this case, going from 48,000 sample rate down to 960 sample rate. Okay. So that's a multifunctional block there. <laughs> so if you go back to the page for a sec, um, maybe I should do that, look on my own. Um, the, when you do, when you go down the dem decimation, it's above and below zero hertz, I guess. Is that? And then yes. if you need to shift it up, then you just uh, say, okay, move your, your. Yeah, I'll read up on it. Okay. But that's that's good. Thank you. Yeah. So coming out of the the output of that filter, it is well, like this drawing shows, it's decimated, and it's uh, centered at the center frequency of the ready tones, but it's also converted to complex because I, the, uh, I guess it could all be done in float. Right. Well, no, the quad, quadrature demod has to be in complex. That's why I did that. 
it needs the plus and minus frequencies as inputs. So I needed to get that out of the fur filter and into the DMOD. And then its output is back to float. <laughs> You can uh, let's see what do I want to do here. Okay, here's my GitHub page. So you've got ready receive and ready transmit. So if you if you went here. You've got the flow graph, you've got the Python, you've got a, a picture of it, and there's the embedded Python code that I showed you right there. So it's, a, it's all yours for the playing with, and uh, feel free to, to fork it and make modifications if you like. Uh, one of the things that people have talked about doing is, uh, let's see, I'll stop the sharing now. Yeah. Uh, one of the things people have talked about doing is putting in some tuning mechanism to uh, automatically tune into those uh, frequencies sort of like a, an automatic frequency control. And that would be an interesting project, but I haven't had the time to do that yet. <laughs> I still have a question. I don't know if still, yes. do we still have time. Um, I also did an RTTY decoder or the demo on that. And the codes I found or the drawing I found actually uses a block recovery block, a clock recovery block, because in your case, you do the synchronization of where does my Bodo sign starts in your Python code. There seems to be blocks like the clock recovery, which seems to be able to do that magically. <laughs> but it only recovers symbols. Yes. So we it's, give it, the, you have the omega, which means how many symbols you have on uh, per, per sample. And for some reason, it seems to be able to uh, well, magically do itself. So I don't know what is the best to do. To do. Use well, these uh, magical blocks that some, seems to do uh, everything for you or? I don't think the magical blocks are gonna recover the, the uh, bytes. It's they going could. to give you a bit stream yes. that's synchronized to the clock, but you still have to do this uh, async uh, UART function to, yeah, to but you find... need to find your start and stop bit. Okay, but apart right. from that, you need to know where your bit starts in your data samples. Because in your case, what you're doing, you get a uh, sample per sample that actually goes into your Python code, and then you need to find yourself where does the start bit stop and start. Am I correct? Or you? Well, I, I, you're right. I think you're right. I think that's what the Python code is doing. Yeah, it's... it is a software. You are, and if you're not familiar with that term, I, I know a, what it is. That's not okay. So it's a software. You are uh, new radio does not have a UART function. Yeah, but it, the, it the is question here is how, bits, how, how do you streams? How do you determine if where actually your bit start bit starts in your samples stream that comes in? That happens in your Python code, I guess. Yes. Yes, and, exactly. the, and the, the clock recovery block seems to do that by itself. So I don't know what actually is the best choice to use. The problem with the clock recovery block, you have uh, except one parameter, which is the number of samples per symbol, which I understand. There are four other parameters. I have no idea what they're doing. So that's a bit the problem with those magical blocks that they have a lot of parameters that, uh, well, are uh, magic, I guess. Far, uh, I, yeah. Well, the. You, if you use one of the, the GR blocks, you're going to find some some zero bits going through the data, but how do you know which one is the start bit? So okay. I don't 
I don't know of any GR blocks that will that, that's that's take part, out. that's part two. I think first you need to know where your start where your bit actually starts in your samples, your audio samples, and then from there I need to find where does actually my Baudot character starts. Yeah, well, but that's the second step. But the first step the, for that, I found this clock recovery block, the clock recovery MM. Um, there are probably three or four of them, and I have no idea what actually they do and which one is best, <laughs> and if it is a good yeah. idea to use them, yes or no. Uh, I think Adrian uh, wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, it is uh, the clock recovery MM is uh, something that I use as well uh, everywhere. So anywhere you have more than uh, more than one sample per symbol, you you have basically have to use the clock recovery block. And I think uh, right now in um, in uh, radio after version 3.8, there's a better uh, clock recovery block called this uh, symbol synchronizer block. It's oh. uh, should which should practically accommodate all the algorithms which are included in uh, older versions of the radio. So it's uh, uh, for um, uh, phase modulated uh, signals, it's uh, the polyphase uh, clock uh, synchronizer block, uh, also the clock recovery MM. Uh, these are all included in the symbol sync uh, block. Mm. But I've seen if most of the use for the... N and, and phase modulation, but in this case, I found it in a, an example, I'd use it for uh, FSK. But in, in essence, that's the same thing. You could use a block for everything where you have multiple samples per symbol. And seems to find automatically and re retune itself to find where exactly the the, the where this, well the mapping between the the and the number samples and the symbol. But I think you still are dealing with a with a stream of symbols that have not been assembled into characters. Yeah, that, or that's bytes. correct. But for that, I had my Python code that actually right. to find out where to start, but. For, because you also do clock, but you do the clock recovery yourself, and I wonder the clock was recovery it and the byte assembly. Yeah. It's all in the Python code. It, both of these ways work just fine. Um, I don't. There's probably trade-offs. There's probably some things that maybe the the clock, you know, the clock recovery block definitely has a lot of parameters. They are well documented in papers, but not. That doesn't mean that it's highly usable. I uh, if you're just approaching it, and yeah, I mean having it written out for this specific mode probably makes it simpler to read in the Python, but probably less computationally efficient. Right. But I can from, make what a I'm, for, from what I read, is that the clock recovery block has an internal PL, uh, phase lock loop, so. It, it's probably much more complicated and much more robust mm -hmm. for yeah. symbols that actually are uh, have a bad quality. Uh, Marcus. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I'm just amazed by like how, how deep this discussion goes. And I, I'm basically wanting to say the same thing that Derek just said. Like, um, it usually depends. Like, there's a lot of trade offs in here. And um, clearly, um, like, clock recovery is like one of the things that are very specific to everything you specifically do with your system, right? You have some pull shaping and they influence how you uh, figure out where your specific instant is where you need to look and take the symbol value and say, oh, that's the symbol here. And um, so doing it differently for different systems is totally normal. So there's no wrong or right general way. Um, I, I agree this, um, the, the symbol synchronizer block um, is super awesome and i think um andy walls like most most of that is andy walls work and he talked about that actually and it's on the internet um now i have to lie that was on at grcon in san diego it wasn't recorded uh, shoot. <laughs> all right that was the workshop it oh. wasn't recorded Okay, we have a subject for the next uh, half of radio. <laughs> so I, I can yeah, that, that, that <laughs> workshop. You have to convince Andy Walls to do that. I I might have a like back of the room recording a part of it, but no, we didn't record that officially. And it, we learned our lesson, and workshops are now recorded <laughs> yeah. because it, it was excellent. Uh, there are actually, I think, some slides, uh, some PDF slides. On the okay. internet of any uh, talk. 
well, or that's perhaps a, that's a bit some other book. So that's a bit my question. Have you heard those blogs which have those super ingenious people who writing code who are doing I don't know what kind of math? <laughs> Mostly Probably going to be better than whatever I or somebody else writes in in Python. So, in some blog that we just do one, two, three, click, 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 and okay, kind of works with symbols that on our test. But if you use it, uh, I guess on signal on signals that have a bad signal to noise, that you will probably have a better result with the mathematically I mean, magical things. So, so this is engineering, right? Nothing ever is like nothing ever works perfectly. Like we like for very couple special cases and this is what is so exciting about SDR for me is like we can actually calculate you know this is the best way to do it and we do it that way we can prove it it won't work better but honestly symbol recovery is kind of you know if, if we can derive what's optimal in any case then we're making a lot of assumptions about what happens between your transmitter and your mm -hmm. receiver to the bits um so i wouldn't you know say what I write is always worse than the magical block that someone with de decades of experience writes, because what you might be writing is something that is matched to your use case. Parameterizing the great omnipotent uh, recovery block might not be trivial. Like mm -hmm. there might not be an easy solution to what is the right way to set this up. And it's totally reasonable to assume, okay, this is something that I can optimize later on, right? Do what works first. If you then have potential to optimize, do that by all means, get help, discuss things, but never be stopped by, you know, my current approach isn't optimal. Like start. Okay. <laughs> this is what my advisor tells me all the time. Um, and that's, <laughs> yeah, I should probably heed that. But is it possible to have another work Workshop to explain clock recovery circuits because those are things that that and, and I'm first to say dumb it down a little bit because those are other things that interest me about these blocks. I would recommend going to the tutorials and the uh, one that calls exam second from the bottom and beginner user level uh, QPSK modulation demodulation. And it's not easy, but uh, if you work through that, you you will have the, the clock recovery explained pretty well. Barry, I think I tried I, I tried reading that block three or four times for that. <laughs> Every I time have a well. suggestion. I have a suggestion to make. Uh, I found it really really useful, uh, and that is to check the GNU um, Radio API docsgen. So that's uh, auto-generated documentation for the GNU Radio API. It's surprising how much information there is in the, both in the docsgen and uh, in the actual uh, code itself. It's something that I always do when I try to when I try to use something. I just uh, go read the, the docsgen documentation. Uh, you can find it on uh, on the GNU Radio uh, website, and then. Uh, Maybe also check the check the headers uh, for uh, for each uh, in the in the source code because there's a lot of documentation including algorithms. It's something that I always do when I when I try to do something. Yeah, it's it's not in the weekend. It's uh, it's not on the main uh, website, but it's it's uh, it's there. It's a lot of information. You know, there are several uh, clock recovery blocks, as I recall, and. Uh, one of the ones that was mentioned earlier, I think, has been deprecated. Marcus, do you know, was it m, &M that was deprecated or one of the others? Yes, you're right. Something was deprecated. I don't like Zeef is a, like a very, you know, nice word to describe my memories. Um, I, oh. I guess um, I, I can't remember which one was deprecated, but yes, there was deprecation in there. Like, um, basically, mostly I think because things got condensed into the symbol synchronizer, but I, I really can't fully describe oh, what was the, that. Uh, I'm sorry. It was the equalizer I was remembering. The, oh, that was MMSD. L M yeah, LMSDD has been deprecated, yeah. but the tutorial talks about it. <laughs> didn't use it, it just said that's another way of doing equalizing.
Okay. Well, shall we wrap it up for today? And uh, I want to point out that, that on my user page there, in addition to the agenda, it sh shows where the chat room is. And also there is a page to leave comments about this session and thoughts about other sessions on the Talk Ham Radio wiki page. And there's a link for that there too. Let me double check that. Okay. Yeah, yeah there, there are links for that on the bottom of the agenda page there. It says uh, talk colon ham radio. If you go to that, you can enter comments about this session suggestions for other sessions, any other related stuff. And then the chat channel is listed there on the bottom if you haven't already been there. Okay, um, one thing I haven't uh, been able to find again is the, the chat for this session. I know it's- There's no new messages. There, Okay. Um, okay, I'm glad you're watching that because I had lost it. I've got so many places to to look to see this various stuff. Okay, well, I thank thank all of you for coming and uh, enjoyed doing it, and look forward to your comments on on the wiki and the chat page. Thank you. your time, guys. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Seven, seven threes. Barry. Okay. Bye. Mate.